So we'll start the second part of the first uh, of the morning panel. Um, again, it's on, I mean, dispute settlement, but here we're probably going into a little bit of more substantive issues of dispute settlement uh, in the interwar uh, period. Um, our speakers are Dr. Leon Castellanos Yankiewicz uh, and Dr. Michael Pelding. So Dr. Leon Cal uh, uh, Castellanos Jankowitz is Max Weber postdoctoral fellow at the EUI uh -huh. and a visiting fellow at Bocconi, Bocconi University. So um, he currently uh, researches the notion of subjective rights across public and private international law in a historical perspective. Ah, and he was a visiting fellow at the Lauder Park Center. Yes. In 2017. <laughs> no, no, that's just, sorry. <laughs> just because Dr. Grant is here. <laughs> and, um, and then we, and then, um, Mr., and then um, uh, we have um, um, Dr. Michael Erpelding. I told him that I tried to learn German when I was in France studying, and he told me that was a mistake, and I understand it. That's why I never learned how to speak German. So uh, he is, a, again, a member of the house? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Max Plant, but, but I see he holds a PhD from Sorbonne, so. And he's Luxembourgish, yeah. yes, he told me, he told me. I made a mistake of thinking he was something else. Uh, so, he's <laughs> so he's written um, uh, a PhD on anti-slavery anti and uh, the law of civilized nations. Well, civilized, we'll come back to that, so. So we'll go uh, straight into, um, the two, our two speakers, uh, Leon will have the floor first on the minority protection uh, system in the Versailles uh, settlement. So we'll hear you and thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pazartis, for that very kind introduction. And thank you so much to the directors of the Max Planck Institute here in Luxembourg, Professors Helen Ruiz Fabry and Professor uh, Burkhard Hess for your very kind invitation and your generous welcome. And thanks also to everyone here who is making us feel very much at home. Thank you, merci. I will um, talk about the negotiation of the minorities treaties, the interwar minorities treaties at the League of Nations. And I will go in four parts. First, I'll talk a little bit about the background of the minorities treaties during the war. Uh, specifically what the great powers were talking about uh, before they started negotiating the Versailles Treaty as regards minorities. Then I will go through the main provisions of the minorities treaties and their main innovation as well, which was the internationalization of standards of equality, equal treatment, equality before the law, uh, I will continue the presentation with a little bit of stories and anecdotes about the negotiation procedures and, and discussions that took place at Versailles, at the Hotel Crillon, where the uh, Committee on New States and the Committee of, of, um, of the League was, were, were having their debates. And I will conclude with a little bit, uh, with a few thoughts and some reflections on the legacy of the minorities regime, what happened afterwards, why did it not survive the UN era, into the UN era. So when Solon gave Athens her laws in the sixth century before Christ, he developed an egalitarian citizenship by democratizing practices that were hitherto reserved to nobility. This gesture to the intermediate classes laid the groundwork for Athenian democracy and anticipated a, a period of classical splendor to boot. But the idea of group equality for all its historical instructiveness for understanding the legal position of individuals in society has received surprisingly little attention in attempts to grasp the foundations of contemporary human rights or the foundations of the modern, modern international rights system. This is especially puzzling considering that the recognition of group-based claims of group-based identities that Professor Berman was referring to in his opening lecture, has played a significant role in the leveling of societies by phasing out status, different kinds of status, and class, which in turn has reinforced equality among individuals. 
So probably the radicalism of human rights uh, and of international rights, such as the minorities' rights, the, minor the rights consecrated in, mi in the minorities' treaties, the radicalism of these rights is not just the idea of inherent equality among individuals, but also the abolition of status-based distinctions associated with group membership. But if we subsume, as we often do, group rights to the individual sphere, it is easy to overlook this point. So that today, this is why I want to put the spotlight on these minorities' treaties so we can look at them in detail and analyze their legacy. So what are they? The minorities' treaties were um, a way of solving the problem of nationalities after World War I. The great empires uh, had floundered, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had floundered, the German Empire, the Russian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. All these empires were multinational, and whereas we have the principle of one nation, one state, because all of these new states sprang up en lieu of the empires, there had to be a way of resolving the problem of what was going to happen to the minorities that were enclosed within these new states. And so these uh, four men grappled with these, uh, with these problems as the empires were disintegrating during the war. Woodrow Wilson, who is on the far right of the picture, did so by issuing the 14 points, which is pronounced in 8 January 1918 and espouses the principle of nationalities in full. The readjustment of frontiers uh, reflected this, this uh, proposition, the espousal of nationalities, the nationalities principle of the, the 19th century. They should, have, they should be made along national lines in Italy, he said, Austro-Hungary and the Balkans, the new borders. The Italian state had to have clearly recognizable lines of nationality, and the subject peoples of Austria-Hungary were to be accorded the freest opportunity to autonomous development. He also said things about the Christian nationalities under Turkish rule, who should be assured undoubted security of life and an absolutely unmolested opportunity for autonomous development. So a lot about na the nations, but also a lot about the determination and the self-determination of those nations. And curiously, the locu locution self-determination does not appear in the 14 points. He develops this idea of self-determination or ideas related to it uh, much more in a peace without victory speech, which was made one year before the 14-point 14 po 14 speech. Here he articulates self-determination in terms of nationality. He says, no nation should seek to extend its polity over any other nation or people. Again, uh, the principle of non-acquisition of territory, which Mamadou was referring to a couple of days ago. And every people should be free to determine its own polity, unhindered, unthreatened, unafraid. So to Wilson, this is not simply of a matter of domestic stability but also one of international peace, because he adds nothing, in Paris he added this, nothing is more likely to disturb the peace of the world than the treatment that might in certain circumstances be made it out to minorities. So a very close relationship between the general peace, the new peace in Versailles, and the situation of the nationalities, Shea Woodrow Wilson. At, next to him is the French president Clemenceau, the prime minister Clemenceau, and the French also sort of echoed the sentiment. Poincaré, who was um, French president, in his opening speech of the conference, this is the opening speech of the Versailles conference, he says, the Yugoslavs, the Armenians, the Syrians and Lebanese, the Arabs and all the oppressed peoples, all the victims, long helpless or resigned, of great historic deeds of injustice, all the martyrs of the past, all the outraged consciences, all the strangled liberties revived at the clash of our arms and turned towards us as their natural defenders. So a sense of responsibility of the great powers towards the minorities that were there knocking on their door, asking to be reinstated into the family of nations in the form of states or recognized political entities within the new states. National minorities were not the only ones that were being protected, but also stateless persons. And this is often overlooked. The minorities treaties were not only about 
um, national minorities, but also stateless people, notably the Jews. The Jewish uh, had several disabilities in many Eastern and Central European countries, and they were especially affected by this condition, which is why most of the minorities treaties offer citizenship to all inhabitants. I'll come back to this in a bit. But the all inhabitants formulation was meant to encompass nationals and non-nationals alike. For example, the Romanian peace treaty, like the Polish treaty, offered citizens citizenship to stateless persons on Romanian territory. And this provision was placed under the League of Nations guarantee. The Romanian prime minister, Mr. Bratinau, he vehemently opposed the inclusion of these provisions. And then there is a fascinating um, discussion between Bratinau and Clemenceau in the Versailles conference where uh, Clemenceau, when Bratton now protests, he says, Voyons, he shouts, est-ce qu'on est dans une conférence ou non? Admettez-vous l'autorité ici ou non? Il y a des puissances dont l'histoire nous impose des garanties. And so this reference, which is in Harold Nicholson's diaries of the peace conference, because Nicholson was a delegate of the British, um, of the British, uh, a member of the British delegation, uh, Nicholson says, um, the Romanian, uh, this reference, Nicholson says, to the Romanian treatment of the Jews causes Bratinau to flush to the roots of his hair. And so Clemenceau was, of course, referring to the disenfranchised, disenfranchised Jews in Romania after the signature of the Treaty of Berlin of 17, uh, 1878, which compelled Romania to recognize civil and political rights of all its citizens, irrespective of their religious creed. Let's talk a bit, now that we've sort of talked about the background of the plight of minorities, let's talk about the treaties, the minorities treaties themselves. The minorities treaties had three layers of protection. I'll go, go back to which countries were bound by these treaties in a bit. But the first layer was uh, protecting all inhabitants, including aliens, uh, ensuring the protection of life and liberty. That was quite uncontroversial because in the 19th century practice, uh, a, lot of, a lot of international treaties where territorial borders had changed had this guarantee. So this is an uncontroversial one. Here's where, where it starts to get interesting. All nationals enjoyed equality before the law and enjoyment of civil and political rights. Why is this important? Because of the locution equality before the law as a self-standing guarantee. Not equality of proclamation of religion or freedom of religion, not equality in terms of use of language, not equality in terms of access to schools, equality before the law, and I'll come back to that in the next slide. And the third layer of guarantees was the minorities provisions. Nationals belonging to racial, religious, or linguistic minorities were entitled to equality before equality in law and in fact vis-a-vis -vis majorities and the special measures of protection that were only applicable to the minorities. So why is this equality before the law um, phrasing so important? Well, it's a self-standing guarantee and the, the 19th century practice had never offered this broad interpretation of equality. It instead confined itself to piecemeal equality as I said, equality in different sort of sectors of uh, the activity of the state. So a public office, equality in dignities uh, or, or access to courts, civil rights and political rights. Equality before the law as it appeared in the minorities treaties was a new and innovative legal standard. As far as I know, this clause was likely inserted by the American and the British delegates in the Paris Peace Conference and the Americans were David Hunter Miller, who was the uh, legal advisor of Woodrow Wilson throughout the conference, and Manley O. Hudson, who later became professor of international law at Harvard. And one of the British delegates who was in this committee was E.H. Carr, who was the later famous historian, but he was a very junior delegate here at the New States Committee. So equality before the law here playing the role of peace through law. Right? We just saw that the 
allied and associated powers, thought that the minorities problem was a pressing issue that it could make or break the Versailles peace. And here we have them really articulating this uh, equality before the law standard changing its dimension in order to ensure the peace in this really specific context, of course, Central and Eastern European states. Two unresolved questions, of course, would carry into the regime of minority protection in the years to come. The first was the issue of assimilation of the minorities into the new states, and the second uh, was the international character of the obligations in the League, and this was a very protra protracted problem. The minorities did not have direct access to the instruments of the League, and, they had, um, and so they were not very effective, these, these instruments. The negotiation, we come to the negotiation of the minorities clauses. Here's Woodrow Wilson um, trying to give the olive branch or an olive tree <laughs> to a small pigeon. And here's his minorities clause, which he tried to insert into the covenant. At first, minorities clauses were, um, they were there was a, a serious attempt to insert them, provisions on equality, general provisions on equality into the covenant. And they were seen as very invasive, as being too generally applicable uh, to all states. And here, this one is um, applicable to racial and national minorities, given the exact same treatment and security in law and in fact. Here's the first time we see this locution uh, equality in law and in fact as well. Another interesting proposal for the minorities regime was forwarded by Lord Cecil, who was with the British delegation. Of course, a long time uh, civil servant, uh, and as well as his, his family members. And he, Lord Cecil, wanted the Permanent Court of International Justice to, be, to have jurisdiction on the minorities issues. Not only that, he wanted to give individuals and groups access, direct access to the PCIJ. Direct access, and this is his draft article. In the context of the Polish treaty, the Polish government agrees that the PCIJ should let any Polish citizen or group of citizens appeal to the court. Really forward-looking, really innovative, of, ahead of his time. As someone said yesterday, ahead of our time as well. Another um, failed clause in the minorities treaties, in the minority protection regime, uh, or, the, or the League of Nations, sorry, covenant, was the famous Jap Japanese um, equality clause. Here's the first proposed article from the Japanese delegation, in particular Baron Makino, who was uh, a very high-ranking member of the Japanese delegation, proposing equality um, of nations and individuals, all of their nationals, of the member states of the League, should have equal and just treatment in every aspect. Now, what's the rationale behind this article? Japanese people are suffering from discrimination on the western coast of America. Japan has become a first-class world power in terms of naval capacity and power and trade. At the same time, the US is pursuing a two-ocean navy policy, so their interests are clashing. And they both had drawn precautionary plans for war in case their navies clashed at some point. And so for Japan, equality was very important. It was a new power opening up to the world, and it saw itself as deserving of this treatment. Of course, it failed uh, in, in several discussions during the, um, especially Woodrow Wilson and Cecil were opposed to this. Uh, the British and Europeans, of course, because of the question of colonialism. It would have given uh, citizens or inhabitants of colonies uh, equal sort of treatment as those of the uh, metropolis. And so Baron Makino changed the phrasing. Uh, so instead of proposing an article, he proposed a vœu for the preamble. A simple vœu, none, no constraining language in there, whereas the first um, example had constraining language, language. And this, this text was welcomed in speeches made by the Italian, French, Chinese, Greek, and Czech population uh, delegations, primarily because it omitted the previous reference to races, that is, to national minorities. But Wilson and Cecil, they dug in their heels, 
And in an extremely careful speech, the president reminded the Japanese member of the, of the committee that the structure of the League already stood for the equality of nations. Lord Cecil, perceivably sullen, was markedly direct. Either the formula was vague or ineffective, or it had a practical significance. If the latter, it opened the door to serious controversy and to interference in the domestic affairs of state members to the League. But Baron Makino, who was emboldened by otherwise widespread support in the committee, requested a vote. And here's the result. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the motion was carried by 11 votes in favor and six non-voting um, member states. And Wilson says that uh, he was presiding the committee, and he said unanimity is unanimous. Uh, uh, a unanimous vote was required, and he blocked it. He blocked it, even though the committee was working on the basis of majority. So this could well have been part of the League of Nations covenant, but we have no equality provisions in the covenant because of this um, episode. This was where it reached the height of of controversy, and. The problem uh, sort of aggravated the conference. The conference was almost derailed by this incident because Belgium uh, was about to leave the conference or was on the fence. Italy uh, was about to leave as well and um, only to return 10 days later. And the Japanese, uh, it isolated the Japanese diplomatically and they reverted to nationalism later on. So no, no minorities um, provisions in the covenant, but minority provisions for some people, not a universal protection uh, or recognition of equality, equality for some in some territories, in some jurisdictions, Eastern and Central Europe, and um, countries that had uh, been defeated, countries, new, new states that had, been, had popped up after the, um, uh, following the empires, and the states that had been, uh, become members of the League of Nations and had made unilateral declarations. And so what is the legacy, to conclude, what is the legacy of this? In 1946, this is Eleanor Roosevelt in Lake Success in the first session of the Nuclear Committee on the Bill of Rights, as it was then called. And she's very skeptical. She's looking very serious, very pensive, probably because they were discussing minorities. Um, several drafts were submitted to the committee. Uh, human rights drafts uh, of bills of rights, and two of them, Lauter Pacts and um, Professor Humphreys, contained very sophisticated provisions on minority protection, and specifically Lauter Pacts had provisions on special measures of protection. So the most extreme and most advanced version of and, and invasive to sovereignty version of minority protection was advocated by Lauter, Lauter Pact. And these drafts were, was first incorporated by Humphrey, and then they were taken, taken away by Clemenceau and also by Madame Roosevelt. Eventually, to make a long story short, there is no protection of minorities in, of course, the Universal Declaration, but there are a couple of words and phrases that survive in the Declaration itself, Article 2 carries forward the uh, general equality provision, but also has the word national, right? Without distinction of any kind, including national origin. Now, if one goes to the travaux préparatoires, this word national does not mean national in terms of citizenship. It was understood to mean national in terms of national minority. That is what emerges very clearly, very distinctively from the discussion. This was a compromise. The Russians wanted to keep national minorities. The Russians also um, wanted to have minority protection clauses in the Universal Declaration. And so Madame uh, Roosevelt, she and the Russian member had a huge showdown about this. And so this sort of also prefigures Cold War politics, etc. So there's a lot of stuff going on here that is very interesting. But this word national means national minorities, not citizenship. And finally, Article 7, all are equal before the law and entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. 
And so this is a formulation that is carried forward from the Polish treaty. And I believe that there is a very direct and very important contribution that the minority protection regime made to modern international law, in this case, human rights law. So it's more or less to come back to the Greek um, sort of theme that I picked up on in the beginning about Solon. I'll pick up on the Greek theme of, of the dramatis persona of Professor Berman. I mean, the minorities uh, were a kind of dramatis persona that was put out of action, or the character kind of died in the first part of the play, and then in the second part after 1945. He's not really there, but um, is he or isn't he? I think um, the answer is more complex than that. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I, I, I would probably tend to agree with you that it's, it's very alive and still here. And um, thank you for this. So I'll immediately give the floor to Michel, and um, he will be speaking of, uh, ah, we mentioned it before, the, the Tribunal of Upper Silesia. Silesia. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Patsatis. Uh, thanks to everybody who's here in the in the room today. I I guess that uh, after Professor Berman's uh, masterly introductory lecture of Wednesday, everybody by now knows of the significance of Papa Salija uh, for as a symbol of the hopes, the dashed hopes of the internationalists in the interwar period, and as of the apex, in my view, of the Versailles. Uh, League of Nations system for internationalization. So what I'm going to talk about today is a particular aspect, a more technical aspect of this Upper Salesian experiment, namely the Upper Salesian Arbitral Tribunal. Um, so um, in the course of this presentation, I'm going first to um, give you some context about the Upper Salesian question at Versailles and the situation in Upper Silesia after World War I. Then I'm going to tell you about the League's solution to that question, of which the um, tribunal, the, uh, the arbitral tribunal, was an important part. Then I'm going to um, show you some procedural innovations that were part of the Upper Silesian regime and that constituted the tribunal's toolbox, to speak in the mechanical terms also used in, uh, at that epoch. And um, then I'm going to talk to you how, how this, these procedures were used and how the Upper Silesian Arbitral Tribunal operated at, as what they called a local, an international yet local um, court. Uh, how did they deal with the people? How did they deal with states? Um, how did they secure their legitimacy? And finally, I'm going to um, uh, speak shortly about the tribunal's legacy. So, Upper Silesia after Versailles. Here you can see, um, this is the situation at Versailles, or just after Versailles. So you see that Upper Silesia um, is here in red, and uh, it's still disputed because, um, on here you see, for instance, the free city of Danzig, which used to be German. This is um, East Prussia, this is the rest of Germany, this is Poland, new Polish state recreate, and the Danzig corridor. So. Um, Upper Silesia had not been part of the Polish crown since the 14th century, and yet the ma majority of its population were Polish-speaking, or they spoke that Polish dialect of Wasser Polnisch. And uh, it was also heavily industrialized. It constituted, produced 20% of Germany's coal, second largest industrial region after the Ruhr. So uh, obviously the Allies were divided uh, about its fate uh, at Versailles, and it was a very thorny question, it's because the British said they were pragmatic. They said, well, we want Germany to be able to pay its reparations. So uh, the Germans should keep Upper Silesia. They industrialized the place, and they need to pay back their war debt. So let's, uh, and the French, obviously, they wanted to weaken the Germans and to strengthen the new Polish state. And just as they had been in favor of giving, even giving Danzig to Poland, um, then they had settled on the international city of Danzig, but um, they also wanted the Silesia to belong in, as a whole to the new Polish state. So what did the um, uh, Allies decide? Well, in Article 88 of the Versailles Treaty, they decided to hold a plebiscite, so recourse to uh, the new principle of self-determination and to put the country under the international administration of an inter-Allied commission. 
uh, of which France, Italy, and the UK were a part. And they sent some 20,000 soldiers to together with French tanks to Upper Silesia to police the region because the announcement of the plebiscite, as Nathaniel Berman has said, um, created chaos. And there were, uh, at least there were two Polish uprisings in the beginning and also lots of German paramilitary Freikorps activities. So um, they um, finally managed to organize the plebiscite you hold it on 20th of March 1921. And here you can see French troops policing uh, the streets of Katowice uh, during the referendum, during the plebiscite. And there are also other photos with tanks, but uh, prefer this one. So this is the result. Um, as you can see, blue region, Germany. Red region, in favor of Poland. Industrial Triangle, the heartland of Upper Silesia, the strategic interest for everybody, totally divided. So what do you do? The Allies were unable to decide. You know, the French still wanted to, the Industrial Triangle to go to Poland, the English wanted it to belong to Germany, so they asked the League to come up with a solution. And the League started from two basic assumptions. We need to apply self-determination, so we need to partition that industrial triangle because there are Poles in it and there are Germans in it, and we need to partition it. But the problem is, um, it's like cutting a factory in two. Hmm? Power lines, uh, water lines, um, it's like cutting the Lorraine in two or the Ruhrgebiet in two. So all these factories work together, you know. So um, we need to have some form of continuity. That was the second assumption. And um, the man who came up with the solution, with the international solution, was the then um, Deputy Secretary General of the League of Nations, a man named Jean Monnet. So Jean Monnet... Uh, plan was, well, let's have Germany and Poland sign a bilateral convention with notable f new features. Freedom of movement of most individuals, so people will be able to work. Freedom of movement of certain goods, not of all goods, but those that were necessary for the industries. Uh, maintenance, very important, of social protection for workers and uh, of their unions also. Guarantee of acquired private rights. Now, that was mostly for German uh, factory owners and uh, landowners and also um, doctors, uh, concession owners, etc. Um, right of residence for opt-ins. So if you were a German and um, chose to remain in Polish Upper Silesia but did, not ref did refuse to become a Polish citizen, which you should have, then you could still remain and reside in Polish Upper Silesia and you had the right to work the same way as Poles would have the right to work or hold to your, uh, your office, or uh, not, not if you're a public servant, but um, other kinds of uh, economic activities. And also bilateral minority protection, but I'm not going to speak about that because that was the province of, uh, not of the arbitral tribunal, but of the Upper Silesian Mixed Commissions, which were the two organs that were created, international organs, local international organs created, to ensure the effective implementation of the Geneva Convention. So, um, this um, was a revolutionary regime, and it was one of the first cases that's true of supranational integration, as Nathaniel Berman has argued some time ago, but uh, one should never forget that its objective was to break that factory in two. This integration, uh, limited to 15 years, there was never really serious talks about making it permanent. Now, that's very important. And uh, both countries wanted full sovereignty. That was very clear. So, a result the, uh, the, that Geneva Convention of the 15th of May 1922, uh, which basically flashed out the uh, Jean Monnet's plan in 606 articles, so longer than the Versailles Treaty, much longer than 440 articles of the Versailles Treaty, the sessions were held very interestingly, uh, both in Geneva and in situ, in Upper Silesia. So, they talked to the workers, they talked to the farmers, they talked to the big German landowners and factory owners and doctors and industrialists, etc. They talked to everybody. Um, during the negotiations, the League played a very important role because the League Council appointed a president of the conference, Felix Kalonda, a former um, Swiss uh, Bundesrat executive um, president, or um, who had a casting vote, which he didn't use. He could have forced Germany and Poland to agree on certain terms, but he didn't do it. He negotiated until the end, and it worked out. Applied pressure, of course, but it worked out. And then also members of the League Secretariat in key positions, strategic key positions, and 
somebody very important, also uh, already mentioned by Nathaniel Berman, um, Josh Kakenbeek, uh, who uh, was a very young Belgian lawyer at that time. This is in 37, so that was before the uh, after the arbitral tribunal. But uh, in uh, so in 22, he uh, was the president of the draft committee. He basically wrote the whole stuff. Um, so the tribunal's toolbox. What what uh, procedures were there? Well, uh, individuals could. Um, claim directly um, for reparation, for compensation, before the tribunal uh, in case of diminution or abolition of private rights, vested rights, pro uh, um, or rights acquired before partition, property, concessions, other privileges. Um, and each, so the, the texture said that the person enjoying the right could claim, so that afterwards there was a debate about uh, many people that encompassed. There were also indirect claims for decisions on nationality, right of residence, and circulation permits. Uh, now here, um, there was no compensation if the administration had wronged the, the, the people in question, but there were binding decisions that were to be um, issued, and the uh, people had to appeal first before bilateral administrative commission, and if that commission was unable to reach a decision, then went to the arbitral tribunal. Now, even much more innovative procedure, avocation. Now, avocation was basically uh, what we would call today the preliminary question to an international court. So if the, a question depended on the interpretation of the Geneva Convention, a question before a uh, tribunal or uh, an administrative body in Upper Silesia, uh, then you would have to, uh, the court, uh, well, parties could ask the court to refer to uh, the arbitral tribunal, and the arbitral tribunal would come up with a binding decision. Now, referrals were not a right. Courts and administrative bodies had a right to refuse to hand them over to the arbitral tribunal, but they had to do so on certain grounds, and if they didn't do that, that was an essential fault of procedure. And another very, very important uh, procedural uh, provision, if the arbitral tribunal uh, decided that um, it's, uh, one of its decisions was of d'un réel intérêt jurisprudentiel, so of actual relevance from the point of view of case law, because the convention was written, it was negotiated in German, but translated later into French, uh, because France, French was the language of neutrality, uh, as they said at that time. So um, in, uh, decisions of that kind would be published in an official collection of um, um, decisions, both in Polish and in German. So that's the first volume. They published seven volumes with 127 decisions, about 3% of all the cases. And if national authorities wanted to deviate from this uh, case law, well, they had to write a motivated request to the arbitral tribunal and to accept the arbitral uh, tribunal's decision. So basically, this endowed the tribunal with law-creating power, as Kakenbeck uh, openly recognized after he closed down the tribunal. So, how did the tribunal operate? Now, this is a photo from 1924. Kakenbeck, Schneider, the German arbitrator, Kauzniacki, the Polish arbitrator. Um, the building, still extant now in Beuthen, Bitom, now in Poland, um, the, the courtroom. They had a second building afterwards, but both buildings are still there although this building has now become part of a modernist building, but they integrated it into it. Uh, so, um, presided by Georges Kakenbeck with the two arbitrators, state representatives of each country, they examined uh, circa, um, about 4,000 cases, mostly regarding acquired rights and domicile, freedom of circulation, and I counted four avocation cases. Now, maybe uh, published, four published avocation cases, but probably there were more attempts. Um, so, what did they do to, they actually really tried to engage with the local population to bolster their legitimacy. So they rendered themselves accessible to everybody. Uh, you didn't have to pay any high fees to access the tribunal. So it was for, for, the, for the workers, it was also for the industrialists, it was for the doctors, it was for the peasants, it was for everybody actually. Um, legally, they decided that um, 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 actually, if you, you could, as a citizen, you could appeal to the arbitral tribunal against your own state. It was a decision, they practiced it before, but the formal decision was made with Steiner and Groß uh, versus Poland on the 30th of March 1928, and I think this is a very, this is a historical decision indeed. Um, they also showed flexibility with, with regard to procedural uh, constraints, so when people didn't manage to, um, you know, to to, to hand in the right uh, memorials, etc. They would tell them, well, come back to us later with a better reformulated uh, you know, uh, memorial. 
Um, they also were very fast at taking decisions, so they had developed a form of pilot uh, uh, judgment procedure, at, as was also a little bit the case before the mixed arbitral tribunals, but they developed their own will based on their case law making capacity. So they, what they did, uh, they got, cla they got uh, maybe 100 claims, um, they would take one, and the other ones, they would hand them over to administrative authorities, then make a published decision in their official collection, and say, well, apply this now to all the other new administrative authorities who do that. Um, and they also improvised in one case. Actually, Kackenbeck took his phone. There was a German citizen going to be expelled into uh, Germany from, by the Polish authorities at night time, and he would, hadn't been able to make a proper procedure before the national commissions, etc. So Hackenbeck took his phone and, and told the police officers that he had just made an interim decision, and he ordered the police force to stand down, and they accepted. Um, so uh, with the state parties, um, they had to, I mean, it was obviously a little uh, sensitive. So the tribunal showed unity, so there were no separate or dissenting opinions, and that was the clear will of Kackenbeck. Um, most decisions were rendered unanimously, and they negotiated a very long time, although the president could have used his casting vote on each occasion, but he didn't do that. They also sought conciliation. So people always say, well, you know, many, most claims got rejected, but actually most claims were settled out of court because they d didn't want to, the states to lose their face. That was also, uh, uh, and it was very effective. Um, they used legal fiction, saying we are actually part of local administration, we are actually the emanation of your sovereignty, so we're not, we're just you actually, we are Poland, we are Germany at the same time, but, uh, so please don't say that we are imposing anything, because it's, it's only authentic interpretation what we're doing here, so it's your will. Um, and they also showed judicial restraint, so they, uh, uh, for instance, uh, they said, well, if a state tax is higher, this is not a violation of an acquired right, for instance. They were very strict with that regard, social policy, um, any kind of poli uh, public uh, policies were deemed as um, incapable of infringing on um, vested rights. And, uh, okay, this was very problematic, of course, in Germany after 1933, because they said, well, if, um, they, um, if they take a decision with a political motivation, actually we can't judge it. And so, of course, that was, <laughs> that was a huge problem with, with, uh, with regard to Germany. But uh, people, and especially Jewish people, could go before the uh, mixed commission, before Felix Kalonda, and he would give them effective redress, and he even managed to suspend the Nuremberg laws in that region between 1933 and 1934 and 37. So. There was still some international protection. Uh, so this is Georges Kackenbeck addressing the arbitral tribunal uh, at its closing session on the 15th of July, 1937. This was published in the Oberschlesischer Wanderer, which was a German newspaper of Upper Silesia and which was the official mouthpiece of the Nazi party after 33. Um, Kackenbeck, during that speech, said that he expected the tribunal's legacy to be scientific, with regard to quiet rights, evocation procedure, and domicile, the right of residence and the right to work as a foreigner in a given place. Um, and the practical legacy said, well, Poland and Germany will, of course, continue to apply our decisions with regard to nationality. Now, of course, we all know what happened. Two years later, in Gleiwitz, uh, Second World War started, and uh, not far from Upper Silesia and Auschwitz, other things happened as well. So um, it was forgotten after the Second World War. Uh, um, but there's maybe one thing that, that is still actually part of uh, present-day international law or supranational law. So of course, I mean, if you look at the evocation procedure, it's almost the same as the preliminary reference before the ECJ. I mean, it, it's, it's really almost the same. And Jean Monnet you know, <laughs> invented the procedure. So, I mean, there are obvious similarities. And yet, as uh, a Spanish uh, lawyer uh, named Fernando Irozon wrote in a recent article, there's no conclusive evidence as to any, um, there's no officially acknowledged relationship. Huh? Because in 1941, uh, uh, during the Travaux Préparatoires of the Paris Treaty, they all spoke about the Conseil d'État and about other things, but not about Upper Silesia. 
Uh, and even Kackenbeck himself, who by then had become Secretary General of the Ruhr, the International Ruhr Commission, he, in his uh, closing speech, he commented upon the, the uh, European uh, coal and steel community, he didn't lose a word about his own experience in Upper Silesia, which he had been so eager to communicate to people during the war even. But after the war, you know, forgot about it. So maybe a case of um, repressed memories by inter European lawyers? Uh, by European institutions about their own traumatic past in the in the interwar period, or maybe the, tr the war traumas that took away also the, the stuff that worked of the interwar period. Um, well, I, I personally think that we should try to revive these repressed memories because if you want to explain to people why do we need supranational um, um, adjudication in some cases, or why don't we need it? Well, tell them you know look at what happened in Upper Silesia. And you see what we have with, up, uh, with uh, international education, and we take it away, um, worse things might happen, you know, so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both. So um, we can take some questions, we have time. Um, I'd like to make two remarks. First of all, uh, that might be, maybe we should keep for um, discussion or for after lunch to ponder. The fact that minorities didn't have direct access to the League, but that um, there was a discussion of them having direct access to uh, permanent court, but they had access to tribunals. They had access somewhere. We need to keep that because today we have um, groups that have direct access to the UN, so we, that's an interesting thing to discuss about. Uh, the second, uh, I didn't know that um, you, you were very enlightening, and especially the preliminary procedure, I had the same thought when you said it, but also the pilot procedure, I thought, well, the, I, now I know what the European Court, where it took its idea, because some other bodies have been trying to follow it as well. Anyway, but I give the floor to questions, remarks from everyone. Pierre, thank you. I'm Everyone's sorry. hungry. I mean, I'm. Uh, I'm sorry to take the floor every time. Uh, you're going to get bored with me. Two fascinating talks, really. Thank you very much. And of course, EU law was looming large. Maybe a reason uh, for the suppressed memory is that uh, EU law presents itself as a radically, I mean, stemming from international law, but as a new legal order and 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 uh, autonomous uh, uh, from. Uh, international law, and maybe they perceive that at the very beginning already. But I'm wondering to what extent Japan itself uh, is somehow uh, a part of the EU law uh, background story, because I was intrigued, Leon, by... I didn't know that Japanese equality closed, but I, ha I, I have a question about what it actually really meant uh, looking at the text. Was it equality of treatment between foreigners, it was predicted on equality of nations. So if it is predicted on equality of nations, is it equality of treatment between foreigners between themselves? So you treat equally foreigners. Uh, or is it equality of treatment between foreigners and your own nationals, which is predicted not on equality of nations, but on equality of human beings? And, and that would bring us closer to EU law uh, but I was, <laughs> I was wondering what was the good interpretation of that provision because I, I could not really, reading the text, figure out what it actually meant. Thank you. Anyone else before I give the floor to the speakers? Yes, please. Identify yourself. Hi, I'm Parvati Menon, a research fellow in the house, as we call it. Um, so my question is to Lyon. And uh, my question has to do with somewhat just beyond uh, what you called, you know, perhaps the access that minorities had to um, to the league, etc., in in, um, in making their claims heard. But my question is: wasn't a, a dichotomy between the liberal Western self and the ethnic Eastern other um, 
evident in the imposition of special minority uh, protection obligations only on the Eastern and Central uh, European states, uh, while minorities within the Western states were not given any international protection at all because the thought of uh, putting Germany under international supervision was perhaps unthinkable. Um, therefore, even though the Treaty of Versailles under Article 91 uh, it perhaps kind of allowed uh, for the traditional rule that citizenship follows territory, it was, it was enabled, but did it also institutionalize the dichotomy between the, the, the liberal West and the ethnic East uh, by restricting the political independence of the Eastern states using uh, special minority protection? Yes, uh, Professor Berman. Thank you for these uh, great presentations. Uh, I, I think it's a kind of fitting as we're sort of nearing the end of the our time together that these presentations sort of open up. It, it, there's an opening of the frame, I think, uh, and the the, the 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 discussions about the uh, minority protection the presence of minority protection in the Lee Covenant really draws back the camera and shows that these intra-European discussions have to be seen in the context of, of, the, of a global stage, in particular of a colonialist stage, that, that really we're, the, the, the main powers we're negotiating here are colonial powers. And the, the way in which you really can, although we, we, we tend to sort of separate off the question of the mandate system from the question of minorities, these discussions at the very founding of the League show that these things are not separate, that actually the, the nature of European powers as colonial powers deeply enters into the way in which they conducted their own, their own European affairs. And then in, in, in Michelle's talk about, uh, great talk about Upper Silesia, um, uh, I, think the, I think this, again, as we near the end, this question of repression of memories is a wonderful phrase um, as to why are we having this conference? Why is it that this conference is, is, is a relatively obscure topic among internationalists, even though it seems clear for those of us obsessed with the interwar period that everything comes out of it, including the European Union and, and a number of other things. And this question of repressed memories is actually quite, I think is quite central to everything we're doing here today and why the memories are repressed and, and what, what work does that repression do and what work does the, the, does the release of the repression do? Um, and particularly at a moment when the, uh, the, the, the foundations of, say, the post-Cold War order are being destabilized and in which we can see some of the, some of the, some of the work of that repression and how, how it's perhaps part of why uh, uh, things are so unstable now, in particular with the question of minorities and, and protection and identity uh, the things that were, were the subject of so much work uh, between the wars, uh, especially in places like Upper Silesia. Thank you. Do I have any more? Uh, Professor Hess. I have two minor questions to uh, Mr. Michael Appelding. Um, one relates to the German-Polish mixed arbitral tribunals which were sitting in Paris and we have these famous cases about the certain German interests in Upper Silesia. They came to an end in 1932 was a political compromise. Is there any relationship, I'm not aware of it, but you're the expert for this, uh, with the MIT of Upper Silesia or was it really uh, a development which was apart from the other? And coming back to Jean Monnet, in the memories of Jean Monnet, is there something about uh, Upper Silesia and the relationship with uh, the Court of Justice? Thank you. Do I see anyone else? Okay. Um, I'd also like to ask a, a, add a question, just an afterthought, to um, Jose about uh, what happened to the minority system, the league system, after um, Second World War. Um, I mean, is there any anything? Is there any any similarity of the system then to the post-World? Maybe if we have time, or you can 
So uh, I'll, I'll give you, well, yes, I'll, I'll give you the floor first. No, Carol? Okay, thank you. So really quickly, Professor Fazartis, um, it's, it's, it's relatively simple. Um, the League, there's a very ambiguous transition from League of Nations to United Nations. And one of the sort of um, consequences of that ambiguity, uh, or one of the victims of the ambiguity, were the minorities treaties. And everybody thought, you know, what's going to happen to, to the minorities regime? And basically, because the new human rights instruments came into being, and because, because human rights was established and consecrated in the Charter very weakly, very, very weakly, and very ambiguously as well. And because there was um, the International B Bill of Rights that was immediately sort of uh, set in motion in 46, people thought that the minorities were going to be treated in these instruments as a matter of course. And at some point, uh, a legal opinion was asked uh, by the by the Human Rights Committee to the UN about what's the status of the minorities treaties and the response from the legal advisor the UN legal counsel was they have lapsed desuetude very shoddy reasoning I mean um, no denunciation from states uh, we can talk about that later but the legal reasoning was very shoddy so presumably there is still I mean there could be <laughs> some argument for maybe reviving some of those those provisions, I mean, but but the legal reasoning behind that was very, very shoddy. The, the Japanese clause, uh, Professor D'Argent, it was interpreted by the Committee on New States as a uh, national treatment clause for individuals. Uh, if you read the discussions, the procès verbal, this is targeting individuals directly. So it's a multi multilateral national treatment clause. This is what it is exactly very broad, much broader than Wilson's equality provisions, which were only restricted to new states members to the League. Before that, he had another one that said all states members to the League. And that would have meant the great powers, allied and associated powers, US if it became a member, etc. cetera. Um, then he said, OK, OK, so his legal advisor said, uh, David Hunter Miller said, you know, it's nice, but it's, it's not beneficial. So then he said, OK, the new states. Um, and then it was defeated from, 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 that was set aside as well, so no equality in the covenant, uh, only in minority protection. And so then came Japan, then came Japan, and um, it was a national humiliation for Japan. It isolated them diplomatically. It made them revert to, uh, to aggressive nationalism, and if Japan had had that um, sort of gain in, in, the, in the covenant, maybe Japan wouldn't have been in the Axis in 1945. Uh, this is not me, this is historians who have written about this, volumes and volumes and volumes. Um, but this is an argument that has been, that has been um, offered. Um, distinction, very interesting question about the Western self and the Eastern other, the minority as inferiority. Uh, one of my dear teachers in Geneva, André Libich, uh, in the history department, specialist on nationalities, and, and he wrote an article precisely about this question, minority as inferiority. And so the minorities, uh, the minority states really did consider this as uh, a sign of inferiority because they thought, they said, well, you know, you're, you're giving us sovereignty, you're giving us a new state, but at the same time, you're telling us that we don't know how to take care of, or, you know, we don't know how to respect our own population. So what is this about? And, um, and Clemenceau and Lloyd George in the Fontainebleau Memorandum of Lloyd George, it is, you know, he's he's recalling the late 19th century precedents, Berlin Conference, etc., where the Balkan states, when they were given their sovereignty after the liberating them from the Ottoman yoke, they were given also gar international guarantees. So now that you are also coming of age, it's just the same part of the same process, right? So very condescending and very um, and very sort of. Uh, it was not negotiable. These were not, not negotiable. But also, I mean, the minorities issue, the issue of minorities continues and lives on with the Universal Declaration. Madame Roosevelt, because of the, um, the, the, the issue of black people in America, this, is, this was the thing. This was the issue in, in America, black people, and um, giving them or recognizing them uh, in, in a sort of what was later positive discrimination. Uh, was not a viable option. And, and last but not least, Professor Berman's comment about these 
issues presenting themselves at this juncture, uh, these very national or sort of, yeah, nationalism presenting itself as a feature of the, in, the first international peace, which is multilateral and has the crowning jewel, which is the League of Nations, an organization. And for me, that's a huge paradox as well. How the national, how nationalism, 19th century nationalist energy was necessary to create this international being and all of its, all the things that came with it. Without nationalism, which is by definition an international energy because you're trying to internationalize your nation. You want to have a state. If you don't have a state, you cannot, you don't have sovereignty. You're, you're not a nation state, right? So all of these nations uh, within the empire is jockeying for nationalism. And then, um, so there's really intimate and paradoxical link between the national and the international. I, I'm fascinated by it. And so um, I appreciated that comment very much. Michel. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, two short answers to uh, Professor Hess's questions about the memoirs on, on Jean Monnet. That's where I found it, actually. I mean, he begins his memoirs almost, I mean, after a few pages, you, you read about Upper Silesia, but he doesn't speak about it anymore when he treats uh, the uh, European Cone Steel community. But, um, I mean, yeah, yeah, he also, yeah. But no, no, I mean, he does it in at the beginning of his book. He says, well, you know, it's maybe it influenced some stuff afterwards, but then he doesn't speak about it anymore. Um, and about the, yeah, the mixed arbitral tribunal, uh, it, was a no, it was an altogether different venue, of course, because, um, I mean, the, the Upper Silesian arbitral tribunal was also mixed in the same sense. There was a neutral as a president and there was a Polish and a German arbitrator. Uh, but um, the jurisdiction was was not the same because the, the I mean uh, if I understood the Geneva Convention well for bigger estates uh, if the Polish Poles wanted to liquidate bigger German estates there I mean they could do it under the Geneva Conventions but then there might be claims before the mixed arbitral tribunal I think so but for the yeah there was yeah and the chose and the certain German interest that was the big German aristocracy lander etc. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, the, the, for, for all the other people who had vested rights, it was only before the Upper Silesian Arbitral Tribunal. And also, uh, yeah, I also would like to thank Nathaniel Berman for his, uh, for his comments. Uh, well, you know, freeing repressed memories might be very painful also, and that's why it's not done. It's not being done. Um, it would be painful for... Uh, of course, for the people of the region in question, we know what all we know all what happened in that region afterwards. And actually, last year I did something about the Upper Silesian Mixed Commission. We call people there, and you know, we're not that willing to talk about it. You know, and also it could be painful for current institutions if the if a court that is down the road here recognizes that there is some link between this court and the Upper Silesian court. Well, then it would acknowledge that it's mortal. You know. And that this can be a problem, but I think it would actually strengthen it. It would strengthen it in the days of Brexit, in the days of uh, people saying that we don't need uh, European integration anymore, supranational integration, or people also saying we can have European, that's my view, European integration without also some social provisions or engaging with the local population. You know, Upper Silesia offers many lessons for that, I think in my view. I'm wondering whether it's a lapsus of, of speech when we, you, sp you speak about supranational. You're the only one of the speakers, if I've noticed. Uh, everyone's been speaking about international. And, it's more integrated here. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. OK. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think I see no more questions. These were both very. Uh, brilliant and interesting. Do I see? W will we take one or do we finish? We can take one more, which I can't see. I, I see the hand. Yes. It's, uh, Thank you very much. Christian Kohler from Saarbrücken. I would like to add a short question for Dr. Appelding. Um, it sounds technical, but it might hide some fundamental issues. What was the applicable law for the Tribunal of Upper Silesia? And I, I mean, two parts, the procedural law, what were, were the rules of procedure, and what was the substantive law to be applied by the tribunal insofar as the treaty did not provide a solution? Thank you. 
um, thank you for this, these questions. Well, the, um, the Upper Silesian Arbitral Tribunal mostly uh, applied the, the law of the Geneva Convention, which was very detailed. It also applied national law. Sometimes it referred to principles of international law, but it mostly, uh, it really mostly uh, tried not to do that. Tried to actually refer to national law mostly. And um, uh, yes, the, uh, the, the German or the Polish, depending on, on the situation. Mostly it was the German because the Geneva Convention referred to the German, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the Big EB actually. So uh, mostly the German, but uh, yeah, it also applied Polish legislation. And, 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 and you had, there was another question in your question, I think. Uh, no, what, was that the. Ah, uh, procedure. Well, yes, there were the uh, rules of procedure were in the convention, and then they created their own rules of procedure detailing it more. The mixed commission was the same. They created de detailed rule procedures all by themselves, and uh, yeah, and without state uh, control. Uh, just the president actually did it all, negotiating with his arbitrators. If I may add, <laughs> I apologize for my curiosity, but um, you mentioned the tribunal applied either Polish or German law depending on the circumstances. Did they create their own uh, connecting factors in order to, to know when German and when Polish law was to be applied. Obviously, I'm referring to the question whether there were any conflict of law rules to be applied by the tribunal. Um, no, was oh, that's a good qu question. I, 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 um, I didn't delve into, uh, into that that much, actually, so I, I couldn't give you a satisfactory answer. Uh, I, um, I, uh, they had very, uh, I mean, they, when applying local law or national law, they had often very, they, they could diverge also from national interpretation. They always said, well, we're actually just doing it the same way as the, the German courts or the Polish courts do it, but actually they, sometimes they, they diverge or they had a, a very broad interpretation sometimes of national lo notions, you know, so, uh, but um, as to conflict of laws, I, I wouldn't be able now to give you a precise answer. I think, Professor Hess, before when you were referring to the to mixed tribunals, um, if I understood that there was also, uh, uh, let's say, an inter interpretative freedom that the tribunals had in uh, the applicable law, if I understood. I mean, there was some sort of vagueness which left a, a space uh, for the tribunals themselves to maybe, according to situation, to choose without there being any specific clause. Yeah, there, there was a fundamental clause, which was very well known also at the time. If you have an international tribunal, there is a lacuna because you don't have this lex fori, which usually guides you to the conflict of law rules of the tribunal. But this is an international tribunal, so where to go? To Germany, to Poland, or to Germany, to France, etc. It is a recurring problem. So Hans van Hutter has recently written on this too. And... Uh, no, uh, just to mention, um, no, I've written on it um, out of practice and out of academic interest, and uh, probably, um, you know, at, at the Institut de Droit National, I will be in charge of a project on the law applicable by the conflict of laws applicable by international tribunals, which will be a huge uh, subject. So we have uh, no more questions. Well, <clears throat> I want to thank our two speakers. They're brilliant, very good. And all the morning speakers. This was a, just a beautiful session. Thank you for letting me um, chair it. And now, as Solon would say, let's go eat. <laughs>